one instance that I think was probably it's still to this day one of the most egregious was uh, Michael Brown. I mean, it to, they still are saying hands up, don't shoot. Mm-hmm. They are still pushing this rhetoric and agenda. And that to me has stimulated all of this fear and hate and misinformation and where you can just blatantly lie about the police and it's just acceptable. You could say that the black man had his hands up and was executed in the middle of the street. And, and that's totally fine. Even though the DOJ and, and with a black president, a black attorney general found that the officer did nothing wrong, you still can push that. And that leads to uh, the Jacob Blakes. That leads to, you know, all of these other cases. I'm Dave Rubin and joining me today is a former police officer and now author of the new book, Beaten Black and Blue, Being a Black Cop in an America Under Siege. Brandon Tatum, my friend, welcome back to the Rubin Report. What's going on, Dave? I'm doing all right. As I said to you right before we started, just trying to survive the revolution. And you? Oh, do, doing the same thing. You know, we, we, we're both in this together and, I, and I'm sure we're both uh, trying to make a, a concerted effort to do something about what's going on and keep a positive attitude. So I think we're on the same page, man. In, indeed, we are that very much about keeping a positive attitude and kind of knowing what you're saying and all that. That is sort of what the book is about. We'll obviously get to that. I know most of my audience is familiar with you already. You've been on the show a couple of times, but for those that aren't, can we just do a quick recap of the the bio of Brandon Tatum? What made you a guy that's writing a book about policing and and doing crazy YouTube shows like this. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, man, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, a young man with parents were divorced and all the other stuff. And, you know, some people may think that I would have fallen down a particular path, but I believe that God had a plan for me in college. I played football. Um, I was leaning more left. Uh, I got saved in 2008. And I never in my life thought about being a police officer. I knew I was going to play in the NFL. I did not get drafted in 2010, although I was in the draft. And it really changed my life. I I became a police officer after doing the ride along. And my political views changed. My worldview changed in a significant way. And I was a police officer for six and a half years. I did the SWAT team. I was a field training officer. I was a spokesperson. I did almost everything that I could on the police department. And really during the Barack Obama's era is where things begin to really change significantly for me. And with the attacks on police during that period of time and and the rhetoric coming from the White House, this book idea came to my mind, man. I said, you know what? I feel like I'm getting beat up from both directions. I'm getting beat up as a black black man trying to be a police officer by the black community. And then I'm getting beaten up for wearing a uniform in general by the population that have been swindled by the propaganda from, from the mainstream media and these political leaders. And I said, one day I'm gonna write a book. And, and uh, I wrote the book last year and leading into this year, I made some additions to it because of uh, the George Floyd situation. However, it's going to be published November 30th and I'm excited about it. So there's obviously a a ton to talk about there related to when things changed with policing and how it changed. Uh, But you mentioned sort of getting it from both sides. And we've talked about that a little bit before, but can you just go into that a bit more? How going into these black communities as a black man, in some ways you told me last time, it kind of helped at times because it gave you a little cred. But then in another way, it was sort of like you were seen as like a traitor or something like that. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, some things, some people, there were reasonable, rational individuals. Um, sometimes they felt the connection with me because I look like them, you know, and, and maybe I sound like them because I, I got a kind of a country accent. It kind of gone. It's kind of gone away now. But at the time, you know, I was a lot more country. <laughs> And so people maybe identify with me and I was able to communicate with individuals that some officers couldn't Um, more so than not. People would criticize me because I'm black and and you working for the white man and you a traitor to your people. And, you know, even when they would spew rhetoric, this is the white man system, it's systemic racism. It's like, look, I'm a part I'm a part of this system and you are proclaiming that I'm a problem and that I'm involved in systemic racism. Um, And even just last week. I was uh, two weeks ago, I was at the Revolt Summit, uh, which is a a summit for primarily just black people. I think uh, a lot of celebrities there. Rick Ross was there. Uh, P. Diddy is there. He runs the, the organization. And I was on the panel as a black police officer and literally everything I said to support the relationship between law enforcement and, and the black community, I got booed. Um, so that that sentiment 
is the reason why I think, you know, kind of drew me to writing this book and wanting to express this is another side of it that people may not understand is that this is what it's like actually being a black man in America on a police department. Did I did I see a clip of that from Revolt? Did you post a clip of that getting booed or am I thinking no, of, I, I think I may be thinking of something else. It was not that. They may have posted, uh, Tater Report may have posted that I had attended there, but you know what? The funny thing is they scrapped, when they posted this live, because it was pre-recorded, mm-hmm. they scrapped everything me and that other black officer said. Wow. And we said a lot of profound things that I think could be invaluable to the community, and they deleted it when they posted it, which is it's shameful. So what do you make of that? I mean, you were invited. It's not as if they don't know what you think, right? Like, it's not that you're going to suddenly get there and they're going to be like, holy cow, this guy, uh, you know, doesn't fall in line with us exactly. They know that to begin with. What do you make of even being invited? And then were you able to get across any of the ideas to some of the people that maybe were booing you? Nah, I mean, there were people there that already agreed kind of with the sentiment, Uh, the police officers that were there, all the black cops that were there supporting the event. Um, Some people already agreed, but the others, you know, they had their mind fixed. And you can see that it's a rigged situation where you have, uh, you know, them having other voices to express the totality of the black experience. And then when it when the push come to shove, when the audience is bigger than 50 people, when it's going out to the millions of people that follow the revolt uh, network, they completely silence your voice. And the, and the crazy thing is, is that they allowed the misrepresentation of police officers and hateful divisive rhetoric or divisive rhetoric. They allowed those uh, uh, panelists to have a, a highlighted voice and then he deleted everybody else that, that said anything different. So it, to me, it speaks to the bigger ar- overarching issue that there's a, uh, a, a effort and a push in order to block any uh, thought that's different than the mainstream idea they want to push. Right. So you mentioned, okay, the the way the black community sometimes felt when you'd go into these neighborhoods. And then you mentioned the other side that you were getting it from both sides. You're sort of describing that already. But what was that like as a police officer? You're saying, okay, I'm going in to do my job, but now here's the people on the outside who are also hitting you for it. Yeah. And and one thing that I learned before I became a police officer that I had no idea what police officers actually did. And then when I became a police officer, I was like, Oh my God, man, we do stuff that people have no idea about. I mean, we're put in situations, the things that we see, the stress that we are under, the decisions that we have to make in a, in a split second when, uh, you know, you take it to trial and, and attorneys have months, years to deliberate and figure out a strategy to argue your, you know, half a second decision. Um, but we would get pushback, you know, with the George Floyd stuff, not the George Floyd, because I wasn't a, a cop during that time, but Michael Brown and some of these other mm-hmm. incidents people just projected negativity on you. You had to be a murderous thug, even though none of that happened in the city of Tucson where I worked. And it was it was hard, man. It was very disheartening because I knew the men and women who work with me and work around the country, putting your life on the line for other people. I mean, this is not a video game, man. This is not, oh, this, you know, like a, like a pre-recording or something. I mean, you, you mess up, it's real life. This is, this is real at, re- at real time. And the men and women, I knew their families, a lot of people, just great individuals who have a passion for supporting their communities and to see them get just ragged on with false narratives being pushed was something that was like, you know what, I got to write a book and I got to tell the story and correct some of this stuff because people aren't getting a fair evaluation of law enforcement. So that's exactly what you do in the book. And you mention many of the names that people have heard. And if you want to highlight one particular story, feel free. But one of the things that I find interesting about this is there's a a certain obsession with the trials, an obsession with all the minutia of what happened. And I think what you said a moment ago is right. It's like, you guys have to make snap decisions. It doesn't mean all the decisions are right. But then months later, you got lawyers and judges and trial experts and everybody looking at everything with a microscope. And it's like, that's not exactly how it all happens in real life. Yeah, I mean, you got to think of this. You know, some people have probably experienced a a dramatic situation where they felt um, afraid or a tense situation where sometimes they feel like they froze or they had tunnel vision or they didn't know what was going on. They're shaking. Adrenaline is rushing. You got to imagine the police officers are experiencing what you are experiencing, but then have to make a decision whether to kill somebody or not or whether to, you know, do different arrests or chase in a split second. And then after the fact. People Monday morning quarterback and say, you know, I wouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have shot that person. But it's like the same fear that you feel from somebody knocking on your door whom you don't know who it is. 
you know, which is nowhere near the fear of a man pulling a gun out on you or you think he pulling a gun out on you. Um, I just wish that people could have a glimpse in, in, into policing where they could say, OK, I understand. I may not agree. The cop may be wrong, but at least I'm coming from a standpoint and saying, I understand the stress. I understand what these officers may go through. There may be another side of this that I may need to consider before making a a, a formal conclusion. So the, the goal is not to convince or brainwash anybody into anything, but to say there's another side of this that you may want to be privy to so you can make an educated opinion about things that go on in law enforcement. You talk about the media a lot in the book, obviously. I mean, is that problem that you're laying out right there, is that purely on the media or should the police departments be doing something different? Should the, you know, local, the mayors, the governors, like where does that really fall when, when you have that disconnect between what's really going on and then what we see? I think there's blame to go around in all, all aspects. You know, law enforcement, you know, I, I would like to consider them to hold themselves accountable as well. And that we need to work on our messaging. We need to work on being more involved in the community. We need to recruit individuals from the community to be a part of the police department. So the police department has an objective. You know, the leaders, uh, local government, they have an objective as well. I mean, they need to push and promote and support the joining together of the community and police and also parents, people people who are in the community. It's not just the police officers. You need to raise your children in a way in which you're not demonizing law enforcement before they ever have an interaction. Why can't you go out as a community leader and say, look, we want to be more involved in the community. We want to do ride alongs. Everybody together should work in a sense to, to make sure that that connection happens. Um, it's, I don't believe it's just one side or the other. I think everybody has to come together and then we can see a, a better, more equitable relationship between law enforcement and the community. Right, that was equitable in a good sense, not the way that yes. the word is usually used. How worried right. are you How worried are you that, um, that basically what has happened now in the Democrat cities, in the progressive cities, is they've demonized the police to such a point and defunded the police to such a point that not only are you gonna get less qualified people, but that the, the breakdown is just too severe. Sort of like in uh, Minneapolis, Ilhan Omar, she defunded the police. And then when people saw a crime spike and murders spike and everything else, what'd she do? She blamed the police for not doing their job because there weren't enough of them. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. You gotta kind of admire the evil. Yeah, they, I mean, these people are, I think that they are not acting in good faith. Right. I believe they push rhetoric that they think could be trendy enough to get them elected, but it doesn't have real life application. And in many cases, they would love to see things get destroyed so they can be the the the, the focus of change. You know, it's like, no, you created the problem. Now you want to be the solution to the problem. You know, and, and I think that that's where they're coming from. The citizens are experiencing this. I mean, when you demoralize the police because defunding the police happens in a in a in a in a, in a uh, fiscal year. Right. So if you talk about defunding now, you have to wait to the next budget then to cut the budget. Um, so they may not have, uh, have the effects of the defunding until the next fiscal year. However, when you mention it, you start to demoralize the police department. You start to create rhetoric and, 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 and the uh, morale of the police department begin to crumble. Police begin to, to or they eliminate proactive policing, which is one of the main key of policing to help the community and to stop crime is being proactive. They stay they that pers perspective of policing begins to go away. Good officers with training and experience and leadership leave the pol police department through retirement. And then you have young people coming up with no guidance, young people coming up lost in the police department. And then if you don't pay them well, the people who are good and, and they'll get another job, then you're going to be stuck with people who may not, not everybody, but may not be as qualified. And then you have unqualified police without proper training in, in, in finance. So I, I really wish that, that that people would take a step back and look at it and say, what are the complaints of law enforcement? OK, we, they need better training. OK, we need more funding so that we can train officers, recruit better officers. That takes more money, not less money. Now, you can reallocate funds um, if you feel like there's wasteful spending. But to completely, you know, de I would say uh, defund, uh, them. defund. Yeah. I was going to say devalue, demonetize, but but defund we'll, the police. We'll be demonetized. We know that. that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to that word demonetization. So, I, you know, to you know, to defund the police is yeah. it's not it's not a winning strategy. And, and the crime rate has, has spoken on that behalf. Do you see any hope in that regard that as we've seen these cities defund? I mean, Seattle did a major defund push. We got chopped. Crime went crazy, murders, I think something like six up 600%. But now suddenly 
They're saying, okay, maybe we're not gonna fully defund or the mayor of even crazy Portland who you know got heckled out of his own apartment, had to leave because of protesters and move. Suddenly he's moving a little against it. Do you see some hope in some of these places? Yeah, I think that things ebb and flow. You know, you're going to have uh, police b- becoming excellent and then you're going to have times where they hate the police. And and I think that we're experiencing that now because it's a mathematical equation. It's very simple. There's no way to evade it. If you defund the police, you lose police officers, then you cannot have an adequate amount of people to, to um, push law and order. And so people are going to do crimes. And, and here's the here's another thing. In addition to defunding the police and demoralizing the police, when you have the prosecutors not even prosecuting people on crimes, especially in places like California and different places where you can steal nine hundred dollars worth of stuff and you're not going to be prosecuted. When you couple that with defunding the police, I mean, you a city cannot exist. A city cannot stand. Small businesses cannot live. Even major corporations have the financial support to leave a city. And then you have an economic structure that's that's you know downtrodden or destroyed in some of these cities where you see the proliferation of violence and proliferation of theft. I mean, we see it all over the country now. People are just bum rushing these places, stealing hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars worth of property. It can only go on so long before people begin to say, "Okay, enough is enough. There's no way we can survive this." You know, people are dying every day in the streets. I, I, I come outside. I used to be able to have my car to park it on the street. Now it's getting vandalized. People taking my my property. I don't feel safe. Um, when when that begins to happen, you see the character of, of people voting. You see that begin to change. I went out to dinner in San Francisco with our friend Candace Owens. We went to a nice steak joint, Morton Steakhouse, on a nice street in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Our car got broken into. They stole my bag with my notebooks and my clothes and my Nintendo Wii, the whole thing. <laughs> And, uh, and I took pictures of the broken glass outside the restaurant. And I said, hey, my car just got broke into, or the car we were, we were, that was driving us around just got broke into while we were in San Francisco. And I had, I kid you not, thousands of responses basically saying, what kind of idiot leaves a bag in a car on the street yeah. in San Francisco? That's how bad it's gotten. Yeah, that's troubling, man. I mean, I, I don't know if we're getting desensitized um, to crime, but it's like in a, in a normal sense, maybe even before, you know, a, a decade, a, a couple decades ago, this probably wouldn't have been as prevalent. Like you should be able to believe that people aren't going to take your property that belongs to you. It's, it's we, we don't live in a, in, in a society where you could just break the law just because you feel like it. And if you do break the law, there should be accountability. And now people expect you to say, oh, you, you can't leave your stuff in the car, even though it belongs to you, even though you lock your car, you can't leave it in there because there's a somehow the burden is on you to protect your property from people who are, are thieving. And, and I don't think that's the way society is structured and the way it should work. The, the way that we should look at society is that if it don't belong to you, you shouldn't put your hands on it. If you don't live there, you shouldn't be going into somebody else's property. It's that simple. And if you do, you got you have to be held accountable and that's in the, in the cities where they believe law and order is important and they fund their police and they support investigations like that. Because I know that people may think it's a small deal, man, but I bet you were hurt over losing that stuff. You felt violated. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's a real feeling. In the, in the, in to, and for cities to defund the police and say, oh, that's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal to you. That's going to affect your life and your emo- emotionally. Um, so uh, I, I really wish they would change the way they perceive uh, criminal behavior and us to start cracking down on it. Yeah, and it was more the way that so many people were just saying the same thing, like, ah, what kind of idiot does that? As if like, you just don't, it's like we've all just accepted the the horror that that is going on up there. Um, What kind of uh, pushback do you get from officers who say, well, actually, if we don't prosecute some of these crimes, maybe that helps us because we're not stretched as thin, Some of these people, they're either on drugs or mentally ill. Like, that's not exactly what we should be doing. Like, how does that conversation go? Well, I I believe most reasonable officers don't disagree with me because 
if we don't prosecute these people, they don't just disappear, right? If you're smoking crack today, you're gonna be smoking crack tomorrow. And if you're breaking into buildings today, you're gonna be breaking in tomorrow. Um, most officers would agree that we need to be stronger on it and, and the prosecutors need to prosecute people and actually take them to jail for the things that they do. Um, just like we saw in Wisconsin, you know, you got the guy running over people. He had just made a cash bail of like a thousand dollars and he's a convicted felon. He, he, he is a dangerous criminal. He should have never been on the streets. And so when you do things, like bail reform and all this crazy stuff that they do, this person is the next crime. This person is the next suspect in a, in a, in a violent murder. And so law enforcement officers, and, and I don't get much pushback from it, but those who may want to push back, it's like, use your common sense. Like, we do need to hold these people accountable. Just because if marijuana is legal, that does not mean that people aren't going to, the crime that's associated with marijuana uses, the sales, the production, the shipping, it, even the illegal marijuana, that's not going to stop because it's legal. Um, you can make heroin legal. That's not going to stop people from the effects of heroin, the criminal element of heroin, the violence that come along with heroin, heroin, the gun violence that's associated with these things. They're going to still persist. It's not going to stop just because uh, a law says it's legal or illegal. Yeah, it's funny because it's like I can make a lot of good libertarian arguments on legalizing and all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but as I've discussed with Michael Malice many times, it's like you still don't want the crack house next door, whether it's legal or illegal. <laughs> you know it comes with a whole a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so you do write about a bunch of the names that we've all heard about over these last couple of years. Um, uh, but you know, before we get into that, we, since you mentioned what happened just now in Wisconsin uh, and the cash bail that let this guy out, what, what would you say is the most shocking part of this? I mean, I talked about on the show this morning how within two, three days of this thing happening, it's off the CNN front page. They're just not talking about it because it doesn't fit the narrative. I don't care about the race of the perpetrator yeah. or the victims. Yeah. They do, right? Like they like race stuff, but this one didn't fit the equation for them. Right. I mean, it's shocking. I mean, it's not shocking to me. It's disappointing to me that the media is, is just, they're not genuine. I mean, this guy is, this is almost as significant as a terrorist attack. I mean, this, these are two, these are two situations that we've seen the media just blow under the rug. You got this one in Wisconsin where a man is involved in domestic violence. I think he ran his girlfriend leg over. Then he plows through children. This is, this is, you know, I don't know, I, I can't, I don't want to say this and get it wrong because I don't know what the death toll of the Boston bombing was, but you got to think a crowd of people getting mowed down. Little kids are getting mowed down. People have died. People were dead on the scene of this maniac. And this guy is a, is a criminal, a profound criminal. If this guy was white, and ran down a group of black people chanting in the middle of the street. Uh, we would hear none stop. We, we, we still hear about Charlottesville. It was one guy who they determined was a white supremacist. He killed one person. Then he ran over maybe six people, killed one person. They still talking about that. They're still saying this is a systemic problem in our country of racism. And the guy ran over and killed a white person. A black person does it to all white people with, with racial undertones, in my opinion. And they well, yeah, have you, can, you can see the social media posts. I mean, you're not you're not making it up, obviously. Yeah, he, 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 it's, it's there. And then also they go on and on about Kyle Rittinghouse. He's a white supreme. I mean, Kyle Rittinghouse is going to break the record for the most lawsuit victories possible because they all disparaged him. However, he was he was not guilty. He always have been not guilty. It's not even close. But they bash him in the media. The black kid in Dallas, Texas who went into the school, I think it was in Arlington, technically, he went into the school, he got into a fight, he pulled a gun out and shot t three or four people. One, the 17-year-old kid that he shot is in critical condition. This kid got out the next day and threw a party. His family came out and said that he was bullied. The black police chief came out and said he wasn't bullied. And I know people in the community that told me that he was selling drugs. And what happened is he met somebody out of their money. So he had to carry a gun around in case they tried him. And he ended up getting into a fight and shooting people. This is a active school shooter. And, and he get out the next day. Yeah. And they big, don't even big talk smiling about it. I picture. haven't heard about it. Yeah, nobody's heard about it. That big smiling picture. I mean, it's just, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, on the, on the Rittenhouse one, um, the meme out there seemed to be that this guy is a white supremacist. And if you listen to half the media, it was basically he shot three black people. Yeah. He did not shoot any black people. This was a white kid shot white people in self-defense. 
the whole thing was screwed up. How do we get past some of this stuff? I mean, how, how do we show people this is just not true? Well, hopefully the people who want to be informed will watch the trial, at least watch highlights of the trial, and, and, and come up with their own conclusion about what happens. Because when you listen to the mainstream reader, you will be deceived, right? They make the picture of this guy. And even to this day, you see Black Lives Matter out protesting at, at, at the verdict. It's like, dude, this was a white guy who they consider a suspect. And then you have white victims. You have a white judge. You have a white prosecutor. You have a white defense team. I mean, what are y'all even talking about? This has nothing to do with black people. This has nothing to do with black in general. And if you want to make the argument and say uh, this is a white supremacy, uh, uh, a picture of white supremacy and criminal justice, which white people? The white people that died, they didn't get no justice. I mean, if you feel like they were unlawfully shot, they didn't get any justice. It's just it's just foolery. It's, it's a, They made a mockery. And the sad part is that they're willing to forego the, the rights of individuals, the constitutional rights of individuals, somebody's dignity. Martin Luther King died in an effort to help us understand that we should all be treated equally. They are foregoing Martin Luther King, all of our ancestors, all of the wars that have fought just to push an agenda, in my opinion, to sell advertisement and fear. This kid was never a white supremacist. And then they connected him to the Proud Boys, the vice president of the Proud Boys, who I think he went to jail for burning a BLM flag. He's a black man. He's the vice president or like the chair of, 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 of Proud Boys. I have interacted with Proud Boys all the time, and I've interacted with black ones, Hispanic ones. I was in L.A., and they came to one of my events to help do security um, just, just on their own. And most of them were Hispanic. And so it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a rhetoric that's being pushed, and I'm hoping that people see the hypocrisy. At, at minimum, when he's found not guilty, at least go back and say, well, why did he was found out guilty? Let me go do some research instead of just blaming it on the system. So, so going into some of those other names, obviously we don't have to cover all of them, but because you hit on some of the, the names that we've heard a lot of over the last couple of years, is there one particular one, either the trial or the events that unfolded, that you think was most egregious sort of in the way police were treated or the result of it or, or whatever else? Yeah, I think I, I think I mentioned a few of them. You know, I, I kind of lumped a couple of them together. Uh, one instance that I think was probably is still to this day one of the most egregious was uh, Michael Brown. I mean, it to, they still are saying hands up, don't shoot. Mm -hmm. They are still pushing this rhetoric and agenda. And that to me has stimulated all of this fear and hate and misinformation and where you can just blatantly lie about the police and it's just acceptable. You could say that the black man had his hands up and was executed in the middle of the street. And, and that's totally fine. Even though the DOJ and, and with a black president, a black attorney general found that the officer did nothing wrong, you still can push that. And that leads to uh, the Jacob Blakes. That leads to, you know, all of these other cases that I take uh, some of which I speak about in the book. That leads to Breonna Taylor, where you could just make up that she was sleeping in her bed. You can just make up she was an EMT and they hit the wrong house. When she was on the search warrant, she was involved in a criminal enterprise. And unfortunately, her boyfriend shot a cop at the door and they returned fire and she ended up dying subsequently. But you can just make up the fact that Jacob Blake was doing nothing wrong when he had a knife in his hand and he was actually uh, uh, trespassed from the area. He was area restricted because he had sexually assaulted his baby mama. He shows up, she calls the police, he has a knife, they shoot him. You can just blatantly say that they shot him for no reason. Makai Bryant, um, that gone away because they, they knew the girl was trying to stab that other girl when she got shot by the police. You can blatantly say they gunned down a 16 year old girl with no unarmed. And the people sitting there at the scene saw that she had the knife. And they go on TV and say she was unarmed because in our society today, because of Michael Brown, you can just make up whatever you want and, and you can cry over it. I mean, that is it's crazy to me. That one, when we've all seen the video, she's got the knife. She could basically either stab the other girl or, or decapitate her in that moment. And people are going, oh, he should have shot the leg or he should have <laughs> shot or he should have used a taser, et cetera, et cetera. It's like. Like, I guess at some level that sort of makes sense. Like you don't wanna kill somebody, obviously. You don't wanna lethally shoot somebody. On the other hand, the person who's about to be killed, they need to be saved. They, that was, to me, that one, because it was just so obvious to be angry at that police officer who's trying to save someone's life. Woke up that morning, did not know he was gonna have to save someone's life. And, and yeah, he's <laughs> freaking big ass knife. 
He's a hero. I mean, essentially, he's a hero. I bet the parent of the girl that was going to get stabbed think, I mean, I, I, I don't know these days, but you would imagine that the parents think that he's a hero. I mean, you got to understand, like people who have not been a police officer, the way he handled himself and the way he was able to use force against only that one person, he hit nobody else. He used the amount of force necessary to prevent her from killing the other girl. The guy was composed. He did his doggone job. Um, and, and it's a split second decision. You got to think he see the 16 year old girl, but he also see another young lady that needs her life saved. And he did what he had to do to make that happen. And LeBron James come out and, and demonize the man. And it's like, listen, Dave, this is a, it's a bigger problem than just misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Like there is an effort and an ignorance within a large population of our community, uh, the black community and the community at large of people just being dumb. I mean, they don't do any research. They don't look at nothing. People still think uh, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse killed black people. Like some people still are saying Black Lives Matter. He can kill them black people. It, it people, even after the dude, Andrew, I think his name was Andrew Coffey. He was, he got off the same day as Kyle Rittenhouse on a self-defense case when he killed a police officer in a SWAT raid. I believe the verdict was, I mean, I, I accept the verdict. I didn't watch the trial, so I don't know if the verdict was right or not, according mm -hmm. to my opinion, but I, I, I accept it. But you got to, if he was black, if Kyle Rittenhouse was black, this wouldn't happen. Well, you got a black man right here that killed a white, I don't know if the cop was white, but he killed a police officer. This is prime real estate for the racist justice, criminal justice system to throw a black man under the bus and he gets off on a self-defense charge. And come on, man, like you can't give them more evidence and they just don't receive it. Brandon, I assure you that the pandemic of dumb people has nothing to do with anyone's skin color. <laughs> you know, this is this thing is across the system right now, absolutely across the system. Do you sense that this is all ramping up again? It seems to me like, you know, we had all the, the riots and the BLM stuff and the Antifa stuff before the election. Then we sort of got the results that the mainstream wanted. Okay, Joe Biden's president. We had 10 months of nothing. Then in the last month, it seems like the race stuff is starting to bubble up again. We get the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. We get what happened just now in Wisconsin. It feels like it's about to all start again, almost as if, and I think this is sort of what you're saying, it's kind of manipulated. This isn't all organic bubbling up from the bottom, frustrated kids. Yeah, if you think about it, these occurrences of police getting into shootings with people, or shooting people unarmed or whatever the case may be, this is consistent every year. There's nothing new. Funny thing is, is when election time comes around, it's all of a sudden the biggest thing that have ever happened to us in world history. I mean, this is what they make it out to be. They did Ahmaud Arbery's case um, and Kyle Rittinghouse case almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think they did it for a purpose because you had Kyle Rittinghouse, which I think that they wished that he was found not guilty. And they could have said, look, white supremacy. And then the McMichaels, where they believe that they will be found guilty, which they did today. Um, they were going to say, look, white supremacy. These are two cases that they can compile together to cause the world to have an uproar for the next I don't know how many months. I mean, they are just pushing this and pushing it and pushing it. And with the with the pandemic and everything else, they are creating a crescendo of, of violence and, and, and tension amongst us. Because the biggest thing isn't just the killing, it's the racial tension. It's the fact that the president of the United States claimed that Kyle Rittinghouse, pretty much, he, I'm paraphrasing, that this is somewhat of an injustice. He just yeah, said yeah. that the McMichaels got convicted, which I disagree with the conviction, but I accept the verdict. Um, that they got convicted today, and then we have a long way to go in our society until we, what do you mean? In our society, you should be able to break into people's houses and do whatever you want and, 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 and not be held accountable to it in our society. I mean, they stoke these things because it makes black people mad, it makes white people mad, and they want us to hate each other. And if we keep hating each other, they come out during election season and say, look, I'm going to be a part of the change. Y'all creating a problem. You as part of the change? Nah, not really. You just mentioned something interesting, which I, I agree with, this idea that they sort of wanted the result that they got at the Rittenhouse trial. Because if, if he had been convicted, well, then they would have had to calm down for a little bit. That would be the natural incl inclination. Like, oh, the system must work. I guess it isn't a white supremacist system. I guess, I guess the patriarchy isn't as scary. But that's not what they want. They don't want the pressure taken off, right? The activists I'm talking about, the base. Yeah. They yeah. want 
the result that seems like the bad result because that adds fuel to the fire. I mean, that's a very dangerous place to be in it, with, so that no matter what happens, uh, you're gonna be angry. Yeah, I mean, they want it from both sides. I mean, think about this for a minute. They, when Kyle Rittinghouse's his verdict came out, they are up, the world is in, white supremacy is stronger than ever. They compared, I think they compared it to like Emmett Till. I was like, y'all are just out of control. And then when the McMichaels were found guilty, this is this this should have been mm-hmm. a time to say, well, this was the right verdict in their opinion. This was the right verdict, and we could no. This is a time to say, finally, they got it right, and we got so far to go. It's like you can't have it both ways. You can't say because the verdict wasn't in my favor, the the whole system is wrong. White supremacy is is worse as it's ever been, and then the verdict is in your favor because they found the Michaels and all three of them guilty of all eight charges or whatever they were charged with, um, and they're going to spend the rest of their lives in prison. And now that the verdict is your way. Now, all of a sudden, this is this is what justice looks like. It's like, wait a minute, man. Is the criminal justice system racist and systemically racist or is it not? Um, but they 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 are mad when it is. They're mad when it isn't. They just live in a constant state of uh, of just hatred and turmoil and, and revenge. So I know that uh, that you and Candace and Larry Elder and Thomas Sowell and many other, David Webb, many other black conservatives, you guys get hit from both sides, of course, and you know, get some of the worst possible stuff said about you that is you know, really unimaginable at this point from the so-called tolerant people usually. But wh- what do you make of the people on the other side of this? And I hate to play the identity politics game, but like when you watch Joy Reid or you see the clips of Joy Reid on MSNBC or you see Michael Eric Dyson or Al Sharpton or the usual suspects that are racializing everything, constantly saying the most anti-racist or anti-white racist stuff you can imagine. What do you, is it just purely like, it's, it's the grift, it's just the grift with these people, do they believe it? Do you, what, do you, what do you think? You know what? I, 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 it's hard to tell. You know, Michael Eric Dyson. I, I, you know what? I think that some of these individuals, they have built their whole life around this, around this victim mentality, and they can't deviate because they've wrote, written books. They have made a name saying that I'm fighting for justice, p- piggybacking on real people who are fighting for justice, like Martin Luther King. Um, but they're piggybacking on these people, and that's their whole identity. So. They can't they can't deviate from an identity because they lose everything and they are afraid they're going to get called to sell out Uncle Tom Coon, because no matter how much you've been doing work for black people in the community, you do one thing that that, that they don't agree with. You you ain't never been black. And so I wonder I often wonder, you know, uh, they think the same thing about us, which is very interesting to me. And I tell people this, I say they think we crazy. We think they crazy. How do you determine who's right or wrong? Look at facts. There is no factual basis that there's systemic racism in our country. There are racist people, duh. There's going to be racist people till we all die. I mean, till Jesus come back to earth, uh, even if it's a thousand years from now, there are going to be people who yeah. hate other people for whatever reason. If you go to an all-white community, white people mad at other white people for whatever reasons. You know what I'm saying? And you go to a black community, you too light-skinned, you too dark-skinned, you po, you think you sedity, you speak proper English. Like, even within communities that are the same race, they have problems. We're going to always have these problems. But then you have to say, what statistical data are you drawing from that will give you an inference to say that this country is the most racist country ever? The system is not built for African-Americans. You say, well, what constitution, what part of the constitution that deemed that black people aren't a part of that document? Oh, you have none. What law specifically is targeting black people? Oh, you have none. And Thomas Sowell, and you interviewed Thomas Sowell, and I I watch the interview all the time. And he wrote a book called Discrimination and Disparities. Um, I may have it backwards, Disparities and Discrimination. I think it's I've got it right over here, Discrimination and Disparity. Discrimination Disparities. I read the first couple chapters of that book and I feel like I'm the smartest man in the world. <laughs> and But the thing is, is that Thomas Sowell talks about this, that just because there's disparities don't mean that there's discrimination. You know, so they don't, they, they conflate disparities with racism. You know, they never talk about the fact that men represent the prison system and far beyond what women are. Is it is it sexism? Is the prison system sexist? No, it's not. It's the behaviors of men that lead more men to go to jail. 
just because black people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, does that mean the criminal justice system is racist? No. One tail sign is that black men commit 54 percent of the murders in this country. Mo- most violent crimes are committed by black men in America. So when you look at these numbers, you say that can be a correlation to why there's disparities. That doesn't mean discrimination and racism. However, they use those stats to push an agenda instead of sitting back and saying, OK, All of us have worked together to build this beautiful country, no matter who you are, gay, straight, black, white, Asian, immigrant, where you were born here, Native American. We've all worked together to a certain degree to get our country to this point. Um, You can go back and look in history from the founding. You can go back and look at the abolitionists and and Harriet Tubman. You can go back and look at the fact that black people did not have the right to vote. They didn't have a right to do any of that stuff. How did they get it? Good white people decided that it was not right to not allow black citizens or black people to not be citizens to have the right to vote. All of these things. How do you think that, you know, so when you look at it, we've all worked together. We've all fought in these wars to create a better America. And when you see people deviating from that, you realize that they're they're probably not truthful. And, and you know, one of the things you realize after reading that soul book or any of his books is that if you don't have disparities, you do have actual discrimination because disparities, it's like if you had a country that was 80% white and 20% black, are you saying that you want the prison population to be exactly that, to make everybody feel better? Or should it have something to do with who's committing the crime? I mean, that's, so you're right on the fact stuff, but man, it's, it's hard to unbrainwash people. Have you had some luck in that department? I know you have. Well, I tell you what, God, thank God that there are some people that are waking up. And you know what, the way I look at it is that it's planting seeds. So what I do on my social media and I reach, you know, millions of people a month is that I say, you know, I'm just planting seeds. Not everybody's going to wake up immediately. Not everybody's going to receive what I have to say. But do I get so many messages on a day to day basis of people saying, you know what, man, you woke me up, man. Thank you, man. I used to not even like you. That's what they say. I used to hate you, man. And then I just kept listening. I realized, man, you're telling the truth. And and so there is some some achievement in pursuing truth because truth transcends race. If somebody's telling the truth, at some point, you're going to hear it and truth will resonate with you if you're seeking truth. And you're going to say, I may not like the way he dressed. I may not like the way he said. I might like not like how he said. I may not agree with him religious, with his religion. But man, I tell you what, that's the truth. It may be it may hurt my feelings, but it's the truth. And inevitably, the people who are actually seeking truth um, they find it. And I, I've found that a lot more people are starting to figure out what the truth is. Yeah, well, listen, as long as I've known you, you've been a guy pursuing truth. And I'll tell people a little insider thing. You, uh, you went on after me at a, at a turning point thing and you turn to me and you go, I'm nervous. And I'm like, what? You're nervous following me? I go up there, I speak calmly forever. You go up there, you were, you were screaming and dancing with the crowd and everything. And I was like, <laughs> something is very, very, very backwards here. But I enjoy being on the adventure with you, man. Well, I appreciate it, Dave. Thank you for having me on, man. I mean, you're a tremendous influence, and uh, I really appreciate it, man. The the fact that this is, I think, our third interview, and I feel like every time we have a a conversation, it's always good and productive. So I, I really thank you and appreciate you for having me on. Good seeing you. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.